You could turn off Wi-Fi and do this idea. I like that. So what if I told you that in San Francisco, I discovered a business that does $31 million in revenue locally here in San Francisco. On that $31 million in revenue, it does about $11 million in profit. And, and it's, brick, it's brick and mortar? Brick and mortar. Wow. And it has $100 million of assets on the balance sheet. You want to take a guess on what kind of business this is? Well, it's one of the things you've had listed, but <laughs> does it re- involve religion? It does not, no. Oh, what is it? It is a... All right, we're live. Happy Labor Day. We are celebrating by laboring. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> Join me in this labor, Sam. Let's do a labor of love because... It is a day of labor. Today's episode is all about ideas, business ideas and opportunities. Did you like preparing for this? I love preparing for this. I bet you did not. This is not my favorite thing to prepare (laughs) for. It feels like a book report, whereas my favorite episodes are when I just find cool shit throughout the week and I just go, have you seen this? This is cool. Versus this one, I was like, oh, I got to like go and like find things that uh, like I got to seek them out a little bit more. To me, this is like, you know, in a relationship where you it's like, oh, our relationship is just us doing things together, right? Like, ah, I got to go to the grocery store. Come with me to the grocery store. That's that's our date. But you forget that you got to do a date night once in a while. You got to you got to break out the rose petals. You got to figure out a way to, to, to keep it spicy. To me, that's what these I, these episodes are, where when we started this podcast, it was very much like, we, what, what are ideas, business opportunities for people? And that's how we got that initial momentum, because no one else was doing that. And then over time, it's like, well, listen, we're doing two episodes a week. We can't be having like 20 good ideas a week. That's not really how it works. So we started blending in just cool businesses we discovered, interesting things that are going on in our companies, whatever. That's like the that's like the Costco pizza date night. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> oh, let's go to Costco, get some toilet paper, and we'll get a right, pizza. Right. <laughs> that counts, right? <laughs> which is which is great. <laughs> so this is a throwback. This is we uh, we sprayed some cologne. We we, we got a little hair gel and. Uh, I'm putting on pants for the first time in, in a while. And here we go. This is date night for MFM. Um, where do you want to start? So I'm actually ha- very happy that we have one overlapping thing that makes me pumped. Um, and also a bunch of our things are big, which also makes me pumped. I do not like the small time stuff. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have a range, though. There's going to be a couple that are like simple. um what I'll call like more like simple side hustle. It's like, here's a way that you could replace a job. You're not really going to get rich doing it per se, but you could definitely get to, I don't know, 10K a month, 20K a month doing this. Um, And then we have a bunch of big ideas. So I I tried to stay away from like complete moonshot ideas in this, in this one. I, I, I have a few big ones. What, what do you want to, can we actually start with it? I think one that interests you and I, that is a big one. Do you want to talk about that one? Or do you want to start small first? All right. Yeah, let's go. Last episode, we gave a preview. There was one company. We I don't know if you've ever talked about it, but I could just read your mind and know that you thought this was cool. But in about 2012 or so, I think it started in 2008, but it got popular in like 2012. There was a company called Clout. It was Clout with a K. K-L-O-U-T. And I remember I was just getting started like on the internet. And I only had like, I had like 4,000 Facebook friends and that was like considered big. And you, this company called Clout came out. And basically what you could do is log in with your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your Twitter. And I don't even know if Instagram existed in that way back then. Uh, or I guess it maybe did whenever it switched to Facebook. But it was really fascinating because what they would do is they would give you a Clout score. And with that clout score, what you would do is it would it would range between one and a hundred. I think there was a time when I had like a seventy five or something. Obama was like a ninety two, so like so <laughs> to give you perspective. And what would happen is it was a platform for companies like McDonald's. Well, at least that's who I got. I got like five dollar McDonald gift cards for <laughs> so like their new promotions. They would basically find out like information about your background, so what you're interested in, what you're posting, and then how popular you are. And they would give you free stuff in hopes that you would go out and like the experience and share it. That company was acquired. Uh, They raised like $40 million. They were acquired in 2014 for 200 million bucks. 
But I don't think that was a very successful exit. I think that they probably just sold for the amount of money that they raised at. However, I've been thinking about this idea constantly. And I think it's really, really, really cool. So the way it got started was in 2017, the uh, guy who started his name was Joe Fernandez. He had some surgery uh, on his jaw. Something was wrong with his jaw. So his jaw was wired shut for three months. And so he was like in this hospital bed laying around and he didn't have anything to do. And so he said he, 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 he just got obsessed with can word of mouth be measurable. And so he created this API or he created this program where you could pull from Twitter's API and give a score out of 100 based off of how influential the person was. And he got obsessed with this. And he started going around deeper and deeper and deeper on this. And eventually, it turned into a company where by like 2011, it was pretty po- popular. And this one person um, said something amazing where they were trying to hate on clout. And they said something like, uh, they took the, clout took the entire spectrum of human in- interaction and condensed it into a, two number, a two-digit number that you could use to bludgeon anyone who failed to adhere to its <laughs> score. Uh, it basically just said, it's tacky, it's basic, it's cheap. And they're like, you, you, you can't just put someone's like, give someone a score and that be their self worth. And in my head, I'm like, well, that's actually awesome. That's a really cool service. And so the company got quite popular. It was bought in whatever I said, 2014 by Lithium, which I don't even know what that is. And it doesn't exist anymore. And I was curious about it. And I said, Joe, I, we DM'd him. I go, do you think that this could still exist today? He goes, this is something I'll never get over. In so many ways, we were just way too early. The world still needs something like this, uh, like clout more than ever. Unfortunately, I'm not sure if it's possible to pull out uh, to pull it off and get all the data. However, the idea of clout for anyone in the in our era, like just getting started in the 2010 2014 range, this was awesome. And I think a business like this 100 percent should still exist because when I'm we're sponsoring influencers and stuff for different companies, it's really hard to know what's legit and what isn't. So, what do you think about clout? What did you remember? About I remember it? back then. I thought it was such a smart idea. I was like, oh, this is great. Yeah, like everybody, you know, across all social, you have followers, but we all kind of know followers ain't exactly it. And um, to layer on on just another number that even if you thought it was stupid, you didn't want to be at the bottom. And I was like, ooh, that's a a powerful draw, right? It's just like any other ratings or reviews, but I was like, this is great because it doesn't require people to have ratings and reviews. It could just basically crawl the data or just take the connected data and give you a score based off of it. So I really like that. On the other side, it was unclear to me exactly how this was going to be used. So for, for example, you're saying when we're figuring out whether to pay, inf- you know, how, who, which influence to sponsor or how to pay them, uh, you know, something like this is useful. I think that's the problem with this, that it was more compelling to the clout user who wanted their score uh, to know their score and for it to go up than it was for the brands who needed to find influencers. And so I think it really had half of the problem. I think the second half, like it wasn't a a must have, because for example, you can, you you know, you kind of like, if you're a brand, you kind of know who influencers are. Even if you don't know, you could look at their followers. You can look at their rough engagement and say, okay, how many likes to followers? You get a very quick proxy for this. You could use cloud, but I'm not going to pay cloud like 30 grand a year for that type of information. So the question is, what type of information, what, what would be the, the right way to use that cloud score? How could they, what could they do with that cloud score? And I, I, I don't know what that answer is, but I think that's where you would have to start if you wanted to restart this idea. What do you think, what do you think people could do with this? Or, or do you agree with me that it's hard to charge a brand a lot of money for what's somewhat obvious, which is, uh, you know, which influencers have, have pull? I think you're thinking like a small, medium-sized business owner. And not McDonald's, and not uh, like a huge. Co- <laughs> well, <laughs> Dude, there's a. I gotta tell you, like, you're thinking sp- like a fifty million dollar a year business, not a billion. Uh, what I were tell you a saying? funny story. I uh, so I had I did an interview with Emmett, or I did a pod with Emmett uh, the other day. So Emmett was the C- CEO, founder of Twitch, and Twitch had bought my company. And so, anyways, I uh, it, it went well overall. It's going to come out in a couple of days, but there was one really funny part where he just burned me so bad. And I was just so shook by it. I couldn't even, like, it took me like five minutes mentally to recover from this. I was so embarrassed by it. Well, you texted me. You said, uh, he said something to me that stuck in my head and it almost ruined the interview. He just nagged me so hard. So, like, I was trying to set him up for, like, (laughs) dude, uh, I learned so much from you. I was like, I learned so much from you. And uh, one of the things you taught me was this cool little model during our first one-on-one. You were like, oh, hey, here's a a good way to use, uh, like, 
the, here's a good way to like format these conversations. Here's like a way to plug in. Like here's a, here's a way to use me. If I was a piece of machinery, here's a manual on how to use it. And he's like, uh, you can come in and you can say one of three things. You can be like, hey, I'm doing this FYI. Uh, you know, here's my decision FYI. Here's my and the second one is, here's my de- here's what I think we should do. Do I have your approval? Right? Maybe it's t- very risky. It takes a lot of money to do it. Third one, I don't know what to do. Can you help me? And fourth one is, last time we talked about this, and here's where I'm at now. And like th- that's the update. And I was like, that was really useful. Do- is that something that you figured out? Like, uh, did we- where'd you learn that? I was trying to get a sense for it. And he was like, he's like, yeah, that's really good for like mid-level managers. And I was like, oh man, oh. he's like, he's like, if you're a super seasoned exec, I, I guess I would do it differently. But that's really good for you're not junior, but you're not like a super seasoned exec. And I was like, it's absolutely true. I'm not a super seasoned corporate executive. I've never. I think that's where the word where, where the word mid has come from. Yeah, but I was like, I don't want to be mid level <laughs> anything. Like you, you could be like, hey, what floor are you staying on? I'm like, I'm in the nineteenth floor. They're like, I thought your hotel key said ninth. I was like, no, 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 I don't stay in the mid level of nothing. I'm not. Don't ever put me there. And so he burned me, and I was like, uh, he didn't even. He wasn't trying to burn me. He was trying to be totally nice. But in my head, I was like, oh my god, I just got burned. And then for the next five minutes, I don't even know what he said. And then I came back to the interview after that. <laughs> well, you should have brought that up. You're like, look, I can't get this out of my I head. I should have. Did you Which just? Is, <laughs> you know when you have that like compounding social awkwardness where it's like the thing happened, you know, uh, I'm checking into my flight. They say, have a nice flight. And I say, you too. You and too? Then, yeah. And then I'm like, oh, you tell man, you love I them. screwed up. And then you're like, oh, what I should just do is laugh it off right now like a smooth guy. And instead. You just pause, you eat it, and now it's like, oh, now it's been too long. And then you kind of you're in your own head about it. So that's that's what I did, uh, at least. You 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 accidentally called them at mom. You had one of those moments. <laughs> yeah. I, like when I should have it was like fifty five minutes later, been like, I just circling back to that mid level thing. I know you didn't mean that, right? Can you say that differently in a way that feels better to me? <laughs> Is he like genius? Is is he like one of those yeah, guys? Yeah, he like definitely Samanti? is. He definitely is. That's the other problem too. You can't even be like, ah, this idiot doesn't know what he's talking about. It's like, no, this genius knows exactly what he's talking about. <laughs> is he working at Twitch still? No, he retired. That's sick. All right. Well, maybe Emmett will be the new CEO of Twitch or uh, Clout or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. What's, what's he going to do now? Like go to Mars? I mean, he's like pretty wealthy now. Yeah, right? I think he's going to do like, uh, you know, other stuff in life. We, we talked about a little bit on the pod, but I think he's going to like, he wants to write a lot like essays and stuff like that. Like he, he was in the first YC batch. I think he looks up to Paul Graham, who's sort of a mentor for him. And, and then he really likes other people who have kind of like really contributed to like the intellectual discourse of the world. And I think that's what he wants to do with, for the next little period of his life, not go back and operate another company. He did that for 17 years, which is pretty intense. And Paul Graham lives, I think like as ideal life as one can, like he just like go, he, I think he lives in England now with his family and he just writes an essay once a month. And Everyone just does what he says. Uh, you know what I mean? Like the whole, the, the, the YC Illuminati. They just, yes, sir. Uh, so it works out well. Um, all right. So Cloud, I think, is a cool idea. But what do you got? So restarting Cloud. Okay, I think that's good. I, I think I got a different version of uh, of an idea that, that was sim- uh, like similar, sort of professional services. Okay. So we've had Andrew Wilkinson on the podcast a bunch. And Andrew is a fan favorite. And people, I think, like us really respect what he's done with tiny it's like oh tiny we buy businesses we buy wonderful businesses beautiful businesses right it's a great little shtick and he's got a portfolio of i don't know 30 companies now at this point and uh the whole thing is worth i don't know what's the stock worth today maybe 700 million dollars or something like that six to eight hundred on any day on on given week amazing so amazing sort of bootstrapped um venture and he bootstrapped it because two of the businesses out of the 30 are the real crown jewels. Meta Lab, which is his design agency, and the other one is Dribble. And Dribble is a business that's very very simple, which was it is based on a simple insight. Every career needs its online resume, right? Every job that you're going to do needs a a way to, for you to show what you're all about and get more jobs. And so for most jobs, we have like the catch-all, the generic, which is LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is going to say, um, hey, just put a put a resume up here. Just say what you've done, and, and hopefully that's good enough. But for some jobs, you need something more special. So for example, if you're a designer, LinkedIn doesn't really help you stand out that much, but now Dribble would let you go and post designs, so design shots. So like just like screenshots or, 
or, or images of what you're designing as your portfolio, and it became a portfolio site. And so Dribble itself is probably worth two hundred fifty million dollars. I want to say. Um, that's my. So I'm trying to find the business. financials. I'm trying to find the financials, but it looks like in 2022, Dribble did eight million in profit. But I'm pretty sure that uh, it's like eight. here it is. Uh, it did uh, sixty. So in 2022, it did sixty two million in revenue with eight million in earnings. And because it's a network, that could definitely sell for four or five times revenue, depending on its growth rate. Um, yeah, exactly. So it's pretty valuable. So I think two hundred and fifty million dollars, probably what Dribble is worth. Now, uh, another friend of the pod, Scott Belsky, did the same thing with Behance. He created Behance, which is a place for designers to post their work. To is a sort of a community for those designers to comment on each other's work. But the business model was: if you want to go hire a creative, come to Behance. And so Dribble and Behance both did the same thing. I think he sold Behance for what one hundred million, something like that. No, I think it was one hundred and seventy-five, of which he owned sixty or seventy percent of it. Amazing. So where does that take me now? Okay, so where can you apply this Dribble or Behance model that needs it today? So Zuck, I think seven years ago, said something. He goes, video is a mega trend. And he goes, I was like, what? What's a mega trend? Is that are you, like, he's not, Zuck, Zuckerberg is not the type to just say like flowery words. Like when he says something, he's, he's part of the uh, words mean things team. Um, and so what's a mega trend? Yeah. He's like, you know, mobile <laughs> is a mega trend. The internet was a mega trend. And now video is a mega trend. And he's like, basically video, everything is. Who else be- is on that team? <laughs> Who's also, I stole that from Emmett, on that actually. words mean things. And Emmett calls it words mean things. And I saw him in many, many meetings derail the entire meeting because he was stuck. Like you said this word, what does, like, what does that word mean? And they're like, uh, I don't know. We all know kind of, right. And he's like, no, no, no. Does it mean this? Or this, and then he's like, paint them. He's like, no, because words mean things to me. And so, if we're going to use words, they're going to mean things, and we're going to all agree on what those th- words mean, so that we can have a productive conversation. And I was like, wow. Well, it's the words means t- uh, words mean things teams, otherwise known as serious people. You know, like <laughs> oh, he's he's a, he's a serious he's he's serious people. Like when they say a handful of words, you're like, I, I know he or she specifically chose that word. I love those types of people. He calls it uh, words mean things versus team alliances. And I don't know what team alliances mean. This is, there's, a longer, uh, there's a longer explanation to that. But um, he's like, you know, it's sort of like two, two, the way people think is in two, two teams. And one is like, oh, let's not get lost in semantics. And the other is like, semantics is everything. That's how, we're, that's how we are going to communicate. Um, let's, let's not be weak about that. Let's, words mean things. Let's agree on that. Um, anyways, so Zuck said this me- mega trend thing. And if you look at it, everything has shifted to video. So entertainment, Netflix, streaming, all that obviously gone to video. News is h- highly video. Education has become driven a lot by video. E-commerce is driven by, let's say, video ads and uh, how you're going to display your product. Um, communication. The stupid podcast. With Zoom. We've, we, our podcast we, we, audio has become we, video. We now have to. <laughs> we now have to go to YouTube, and I have to wear like a nice shirt sometimes. Yeah, now. I did. I wet my hair like uh, you know I used to do in school <laughs> yeah, in the water same. fountain. I wet my hair before the pod. <laughs> do a quick little spruce up. <laughs> so, video is this mega trend. But where do you hire people that specialize in working in video? So where do you hire hire people that are video editors, or um, or even like the auxiliary things like thumbnail artists or uh, video strategists? Where is their Behance? Where is their Dribble? Where can I go see portfolios or like a news feed of people who did really cool animations or um, cool edits um, to a video and then be able to hire those people? As somebody who's hiring a lot of video people, I don't find this site. I think if somebody created Behance for video, I think that that is a, uh, that is a big idea. Dribble for video. I think that is I a big idea. I completely agree. I 100% agree. And uh, I'll explain why. So I actually had a very similar topic that I was going to bring up. I was going to call it LinkedIn for X. And the reason being is, I think I think you told me about this. It's called uh, doxi- do- doxi- is it Doximity? Do- doximity. Doximity. Uh, so basically, it's LinkedIn for doctors. You told me about it. So I didn't realize it. It's publicly traded. It has a 4 or $5 billion valuation. It's a great business. So it's basically LinkedIn for Which, by the way, let's, let's put that doctors. in context. It has, I think, 2 million doctors. LinkedIn probably has, I don't know, 300 million people or something like that. Hundreds of millions of users. Yeah, fractions. And LinkedIn sold for 20 billion. Doximity, you said, is at 4 billion. So it's... No, 5. 4.8. 5. Okay, so it's only four times less valuable than LinkedIn. 
with a hundred X less customers, right? Because the value per customer is so much higher. Yeah. And, and so I was reading about it and they had this term that I loved. They go, we we're, we're, we launched this because we are always looking for digitally, digitally under indexed industries. And I thought that was a beautiful ooh, word. Ooh, what's that? Digitally under indexed. Some of that. And so <laughs> what that means is basically communities of professionals who just aren't, aren't being catered to in a digital format. So you could say lawyers, you could say, um, I actually don't even know what else. I mean, there's a lot of them. You could, there's one. There's one for blue collar workers called Job Case, and the reason why this interests me is at Hampton. What I'm noticing is that even though we didn't mean to do this, we're sort of becoming a little bit of a network, not quite a social network. But I'm seeing I'm like, if we wanted to, which I don't really want to, we could make this like a. Have you heard of Raya? Do you know what Raya is? Yeah, the dating app for hot people. Yeah, it's like, well, I, I think they call it like elites or something, but it's like a paid dating app for like elites. So like the for the facially elite. Yeah. Or 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 the 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 uh, bank elite, you know, like if you have depending That's what on I'm actually going to start saying instead of uh, socioeconomic <laughs> underprivileged, I'm facially underprivileged. And uh, <laughs> I've been able to overcome this this adversity. <laughs> yeah. Well, and this shit has gotten me really interesting because I think that what you can do, which basically what, how do you call it? Do- doxity? Doximity. Doximity. What does that mean? That's some, see, you, you have to know how to say the word in order to even get in. It sounds like a drug. <laughs> Forget um, words mean things. Sounds yeah. don't even mean things. <laughs> yeah. uh, but this company, dude, so they're growing quickly. They're doing like 400 million in revenue, 150 million in income. So they've been profitable for years. And they've built this LinkedIn for doctors. And they think it's a really good business. And what I've been really fascinated in, uh, fascinated about is what type of niches can you build professional networks uh, that are somewhat ignored? Because do you go on, do you go on to LinkedIn? Yeah, I, I use LinkedIn. What does your inbox on LinkedIn look like right now? Oh, I just ignore the inbox mostly. Exactly. Why do you do that? Uh, it's mostly, mostly junk and uh, it's, it's spam. too much. Yeah, so it's it's like- crap. It's crap. The inbox of LinkedIn is horrible. No networking is happening there. And like people mostly use it for resume tracking and things like that. But there's a bunch of jobs out there like lawyers, like doctors, where it's a relatively small community. Two million people, three million people. I think there's two and a half million lawyers in America. There's 2.1 million doctors in America. These are relatively small where you could have small it, like circles that know 80% of the population on the network because I'm a friend with you who's friends with you and then now I'm connected to you and like it's small enough. And so I've been really fascinating, very similar to the Dribble thing. Dribble is a little bit more resume and showing off portfolio work. Uh, this is a little bit more networking and but it's also resume. I've been very fascinated by these businesses that do this. And the hard part I think with the, with any social network is it's like what's the chicken and the egg problem which is like you know, it's not good unless we have users, but we don't have any users and we need users. Yeah. Um, but what I've noticed is that there's so many people on youngish people on TikTok who are professionals that are crushing it. So there's uh, like a bunch of dentists and orth- orthodontist people, tons and tons of chiropractors. Like are, there's lots of like professional services that are going viral on TikTok. And if I'm in this position, which I guess I kind of am, am, where I'm thinking like, what else can we do Hampton for? I was like, man, I could totally partner with some of these like and create a Hampton for doctors. But to do a social network, I was like, I, I'm, I'm, that's not in my skill set. So I'm not good enough to do that. But I bet if I could like convince some crazy person like Nikita Beer or someone who knows about networking or networks, network effects, I think you could actually build a substantial size business for niche professional communities, whether they're paying a small fee to be part of it or you build an ad network on it. Um, but I'm very fascinated by these like niche communities for professional services that are more than communities, but like, uh, like LinkedIn style. Yeah, I think these are super hard. And um, when you do them, they're obviously very, very valuable. Any network is really, really valuable once you create it. But I think these are very, very difficult. It's really hard to have one idea, which is why, like, I don't think there's like 10 ideas like this. I think like right now there might be one or two ideas of this that might work, which is why for the video one, I got excited because I think that it's It's not a winner's take all. It's Well, it's clear that there's an industry where you need this and that showing how good I am as a video editor through my paper resume is bad. So you need like, you need a paper resume to not tell the story. Then you need for there to be a lot of people in that industry and a lot of people hiring for that industry. That's the combo you need. And I, that's why I think that this uh, sort of dribble for video editors is a multi hundred million dollar idea. Somebody would, uh, would pull it off. 
All right, we kind of tag teamed that one a little bit. What you want to go next? Here's a different kind of idea. So here's an idea that I think would be um it's not doesn't require the internet. You could turn off Wi-Fi and do this idea. I like that. It's not easy, but it's also not really impossible either. Uh, it, it, so it's somewhere in the middle. Um, and also on the on the upside, I think it's also like on the low end, you make millions of dollars a year. On the high end, you make tens of millions of dollars a year. So what if I told you that in San Francisco, I discovered a business that does $31 million in revenue locally here in San Francisco. No, no, no revenue outside of San Francisco. Uh, on that $31 million in revenue, it does about $11 million in profit. And, and it's, brick, it's brick and mortar? Brick and mortar. Wow. And it has $100 million of assets on the balance sheet. You want to take a guess of what kind of business this is? Well, it's one of the things you've had listed, but <laughs> does it re- involve religion? It does not, no. Oh, what is it? It is a private elementary school. So no uh, way there are private elementary schools in San Francisco. So, the, so one, I'm, I looked at a bunch of them. Uh, the one, the, the one I think that does the best or the one that I found that does the best is one called uh, the Hamlin school. And it's based in San Francisco. It's a nonprofit. So you can see all the financials online, but you can see this for, for many of them. And um, it's just for girls. It's a, it's a girls only school K through eight, I think. And uh, only 450 kids. So 450 girls go to the school. You pay basically a college level tuition. So parents pay $40,000 a year to send their kid to kindergarten or first grade. God damn, 40 grand. Are you going to do that? Uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm out of the city now. But um, the there's a lot of people that do because they have a wait list and a hardcore admissions process. If you want your kindergartner to get into school, you have to dress up, go to the interview, Prep them, be like, hey, don't make a fool out of us. We've been preparing you for four years for this. Come on, perform, <laughs> do the thing. And uh, you send them in and they do an interview with them. Your your four-year-old does an interview oh, with Oh, I them. know this school. I used to play basketball and they have a sick basketball hoop uh, overlooking the city. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's at the top of Pack Heights. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And so there's a wait list of parents dying to get in. And they own the buildings. They own the real estate that they are that they operate out of, which is why they have so much, uh, like so many, so much value and assets on the balance sheet. Cause they own like huge properties in the prime spots of San Francisco. Um, so, and I looked at a bunch of these, there's another one Burks and another one, you know, there's a whole bunch of these that, that exist, and they range from like, you could see, okay, 2020, 2021, how much revenue do they do? Okay. They did 15 million or 20 million in revenue. Some are more profitable than others. So Hamlin is particularly profitable, but the other ones would be like, 15 to 20 million in revenue and 2 million in profit. Um, still not bad, not bad at all. And they, and they would have 25 million in assets on the, on the books. And you can see who goes there because they have to list who donates. So you can see the donations from different families. Oh, that's the Facebook executive. And this person is a, a famous author and famous movie producer and whatever. Right. So there's a whole, how much do they there. donate? Like what, what's a big donation? The, the top for donations are like low seven figures right now. Oh my but I God. Think you know, like they did like a, we're going to renovate the school and they raised $50 million to renovate the school. And that's donations outside of the tuition. So that's just, just please give us money so we can have a better building and you get to, we'll name the library after you type of thing. Pretty insane. Um, so there's a huge number of people because the public school system in San Francisco is, is not very good uh, or considered to be not very good. I, I have no idea what it actually is, but that's the reputation it has. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to do the following. So, so the good for them. Now, what's the opportunity? The opportunity is if you were ambitious enough, you could look at a And if you balance. cared about this topic, if you cared about this topic, you, you really got to care about this shit because this is going to be a headache. Uh, I don't know. Debatable. I think you have to care enough. Um, I don't think you have to like uh, be born to educate. I don't think you're, you know, you have to be whatever. Miss Doubtfire here. Like, you know, I think you have to be a smart person who is going to hold a standard just like you would for any other business. A man and, dressed as an el- elderly woman? You, you, you definitely don't have to be that. <laughs> that's, not, that's not required. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, you can't be that, probably. You, when you probably I think can't about what the most ideal teacher is, it's Miss Doubtfire. So, <laughs> yeah. um, a 40-year-old recently divorced you, man. <laughs> and she'll take, care, she'll take care of you, both at the same time. So, um, so there's all these... Com- so commercial real estate is at like an all-time low in San Francisco. There's empty buildings everywhere. Why? Because remote work, it was too expensive. And now... 
these companies are basically just trying to get out of their leases. So on one hand, you have huge office buildings that are going vacant. And on the other side- Is it totally dead down there right now? uh, No, it's not totally dead, but it's the lowest it's ever been. So, you know, buy low. If that's your strategy, this is a good time to do it. So I think you could buy one of these commercial or industrial buildings and convert it into a private elementary school. Now we're going to need a couple things. We're going to need a name and a differentiator. On the name side, I got a few to throw at you. You tell me what, which one you like. Well, but let's just go look at a bunch of old shipwrecks. That Bougiest say. names I found. Here, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Would you like your child to attend Windsor Oaks? Oh, <laughs> Would you like your In? child to attend the prestigious <laughs> Carrington School? <laughs> that one's nice. And the other one is, oh, yeah, yeah, our daughter got into Thatcher Darby. And uh, if your daughter gets into Thatcher Darby, you feel pretty good right now. So, well, are these just famous like streets in England? I just looked up expensive ass last names. That was my Google search. And then I found a <laughs> list of 100. And then I started pairing two together, like Windsor Oakley and, and, and Thatcher Darby uh, yeah. together. So I think I got some, some <laughs> solid leads there. The other thing is we need a differentiator. And when I talk, so I have some friends who, who have kids that go to these schools. And I asked them, I said, what, what would you wish was different? And they're like, because I was like, you're paying a crazy price. I thought they would say something like price or teacher-student ratios. And they, said, they were like, no, 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 look, these are all going to be expensive. And in fact, I'm fortunate. I did well. The number one thing I want to spend on is my kid's education. If I, you know, if there was a cheaper school, I don't think we would switch because we would feel like, well, are we really going to try to go for a, like a, a lesser education? I don't know. This school has a wait list. It's, the price is not the problem. And I said, teacher-student ratio? They said, no, it's six teachers for every one kid. So on the 450 kids, they have 75 teachers to, to run this school that does $30 million a year. You, you did it the wrong way. Six students per one teacher? Correct, correct. Got it. Yeah, six teachers for one student would be insane. Um, yeah, that'd be weird. <laughs> that'd be a little bit weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're surrounded. Weird. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, the, I said, what's the biggest pain point? They go, you know what? I hate to say this. Uh, I, I consider myself a, a liberal person, live and let live. But there's like an agenda in these schools and the agenda is like very woke. So, you know, like our kids in elementary school have like, they're being taught, um, you know, that there are like, you know, what is gender? You could be a boy, but you're a girl. They're like, I just don't want my like first grader to be thinking, oh, I could, I'm a girl, but I could be a boy. Like that. They don't and this really is at want public that. schools, right? This is, this is at private schools. schools. Oh, and so they're like, you know, and, uh, you know, there's like just su- such a heavy in- in influence. They, they said, you know, it's crazy. In our elementary school, there is, um, there are like uh, clubs that are, you know, it sounds like what you would have at like maybe a, a, a very liberal college, but it's like, yeah, I, don't, I don't feel like that has a place in elementary school. Just let kids be kids. So the differentiator is going to be, hey, what happened to schools teaching math? and science. Let's do that, right? That's what we're going to teach. We're not going to teach political stuff. We're not going to teach all these social issues. Like, they're kids. Let them be kids. We're going to be a hardcore math, science, STEM education school. We're the that's best That's what this one is? That. No, no. That's what, this is, that's what Thatcher Darby is going to be. Um, I love it. Hardcore math, science, and we don't subscribe to all... We keep the the, the politics out of the school. That's, the, that's our only promise. You're here to learn, and we're going to learn these topics and uh, we're not trying to shape your kids socially or politically in any way. You and I have a friend who's got a, well, he's just turned, he just became a teenager, 13. And I said, hey, uh, hey, Brian, how, how's school going? Uh, you know, it's about that age. You're, you're, you're liking girls, I bet. You, you, anyone you'll have a crush on? Uh, no, it's not really working out. Well, why not? He goes, they're all non-binary. <laughs> and uh, I was like, what? what? He goes, yeah, there's only one that's heterosexual uh, and is cis or something like that, but the rest are non-binary. And the girl I like is non-binary, so she said she can't be with me. And I was like, "All right, well, that is a pain <laughs> in the ass. I don't know what to say to that." Yeah, one. no <laughs> advice. I have no idea what you're talking yeah. about. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what do you want to have for lunch? Like, it, it was it, <laughs> like it, 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 it sounds really challenging, honestly. Most of the times, generations will say like, "Oh, you have it so easy. I had it so much harder when I was your age." Right. Not true here. I do not envy a twelve or fifteen year old in 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 that at that age. It's just like, so different, it, it, right? And I, I I don't know if it's better or worse. I'm not really saying that, but I do think there should be options in the market for what you want. Some some people really re- really do want their kid to be um, exposed to a whole bunch of different issues and be a, a well rounded human being and well versed in a bunch of different issues. And other people are like, you know, I don't really want my kid thinking about that. I just really want them to have a good education, learning about 
math, science, you know, reading, writing, those things. And I'd like the school to do that. And I will handle the kind of like the outside of, of, of those, that curriculum type of education. Well, so I, I'm not well, saying one's well, better or worse, gonna be like, be different. Well, where well-roundedness goes to die. Or something like that. Is that, is that <laughs> hardcore <laughs> science machines? <laughs> yeah, what, what we create. <laughs> we don't like uh, standardized testing. We yeah. love it. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it, you, you've got something here. Diversity here is JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> something. Um, like that. All right, that's cool. But that's crazy that that school makes that much money. Yeah. Who um, Who would have thought? I didn't really think about like ever like oh, could you, you could create a school that that school if it's doing you know. You know, any of those schools, those are basically like somewhere between 50 and $200 million assets if you were to sell them. Maybe more if they, one of them has $100 million in assets on, the, on this balance sheet. Like, um, these are these are very big businesses that are just one location, brick and mortar schools with 400 customers. That's kind of amazing. Did I ever tell you about the time I was a telemarketer? <laughs> no. <laughs> so at my high school, if you needed some money, the best job was to be a telemarketer. And what At were we selling? For what? Yeah. What were we selling, you ask? We were begging for money. And so what they would do <laughs> is you'd get paid $10 an hour, but you'd get a commission and you'd get pizza. And I worked that job for <laughs> a year, three nights a week. And what they would do is every time you'd sit down at your desk Sam goes uh, in the evening. They pay <laughs> commission, salary, and pizza. Dear diary. Yeah. Jackpot. That was the thing. It was like, you know, I was 16. That was the thing. We had dinner. It was, they had soda and pizza. And you'd sit down at your desk. I'd work, I worked there from like 3 p.m. to like 8 p.m. You sit down at your desk and you have a phone. And then you just have a box of note cards. And on the note cards, it says how much the person donated previously, what their resume is, so where they worked, and what their age is. And what you would do after this is a little uh, trick of the trade, you find the oldest person there who's got the best career or who has previously donated the most amount of money and you line those up and you just start calling them and you say, you know, hey, Mr. Uh, hey, 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 Mr. Smith, this is a uh, Sam at SLU, your alma mater. I know you graduated here in 1956. Um, but look, things are going great here, but we need some money in order to build this thing or that thing. <laughs> Can I count you down for a $5,000 donation? You did $3,000 two years ago, but times have changed, my friend. We got to step it up. Like <laughs> you want to be a man for others or not. Now is the time. And like we would like we had these scripts that we had to like sell these guys on giving us money to build something. And I would bring in, I don't remember the exact numbers, but like tens of thousands of dollars a month in donations from these alumni. And that was my job, which is to call these guys constantly. And we would do, I don't know, maybe a hundred calls or something like that a <laughs> night, just trying to get this money. And you would get like if you brought in five grand, boom, you got a hundred dollars. Like that's what we did, and it was the greatest that's racket it. <laughs> on it. I don't remember exactly. No, we weren't making because the money had to go to the school. Was this legal, and, or was like you know, was there a janitor course. overseeing yeah. you? What was going on here? How, who was running this program? I can't believe they the did history this. teacher. Who do you? Uh, yeah, it was the history <laughs> teacher. That was that was like his side job. His side hustle was running the boiler room. <laughs> you know, he was the Jordan Belford, and I was like the little uh, the little scrum or the little scrub, just like you know, smiling and dialing. <laughs> He's like, you guys want some crackers? Yeah, yeah. But crackers are for closers. Get your ass on the phone, Sam. Get your ass on the phone, Par. <laughs> yeah, you like walk behind you, like Sam. Is that a work call? Can you please, uh, can you please hang that up? And <laughs> your fingers broken. Why aren't you dialing, Par? <laughs> but that's what I did. It was awesome. I mean, don't you have that? Doesn't Duke people call you? And usually, what they do is now. What they do is once you get old enough. They hire your friends to be the person. So, like, if we went to Duke together, I'm gonna call Sean and be like, "Hey, Sean, you how know, do they do that? <laughs> what? That's yeah. Insane. So, like, my high school now, I'll get texts from people who I was acquainted acquainted with and I'm friends with. And here's the kicker: They're, they'll say shit like, "Hey, I know I follow you on social. I know you're doing real well. Uh, how about we cut gotcha. you down for five thousand? And I'm Heard like, you got a baby on the way, you know? That, that maybe, yeah. Like, <laughs> so it's like." Do I flex right now? Like, because I'm entirely <laughs> driven by making my high school friends or my high school classmates like I want to be a big shot to them. That's right. Because you know I got made fun of. I, that's all. I, that's all I care about is 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 bringing it back to them. But I gotta give five grand to this fucking school. <laughs> they get me all the time. It's been working so effectively. But that's how these telemarketing things work. You don't get calls from Duke asking to give money. Ring ring. Hey, it's Duke. 
lose my number. <laughs> Barking up the wrong tree. Never happening. Can't believe I gave you the money I gave you in the first place. <laughs> yeah, man, it, it's like a pretty funny uh, thing. I mean, that's if how you I have eat. a multi-billion-dollar endowment. You got to lose my number. You're not calling me for money. That's it's not going right? to happen. If my high yeah. school or something called me, all right, maybe. I hope they don't. But you know, I I, I wouldn't really feel as aggressively upset as I do if Duke calls. If your number could also be a country's GDP, your if your endowment <laughs> could be confused with like a Caribbean if country's is GDP, jealous. yeah, 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 we're out. Like you should not call me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, that's too funny. All right, you want to do want to do a couple more? What do you got? Yeah, I got some. I got some good ones. All right, let me give you a quick. Wait, what? What? what by the way, what is Duke's uh, endowment? It's in the billion. I don't know, multi billions. Duke endowment size. 12 billion. Is it really 12 billion? And Duke's not even like a. Top, Don't you dare say mid level. Don't you dare say mid level <laughs> Ivy. <laughs> it's a mid major. It's definitely a mid major. <laughs> not even a good school. <laughs> I mean, is Duke top 20? It's top 20 for sure, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It, is it, but is it top 20, you think, in terms of endowment? Yeah, I think so. I think so. That is insane. Billions of, endow- billions of dollars in endowment. They could basically just run the school off of the. Uh, investment income. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, I'm surprised that um, more people. I'm surprised that anyone gives to these to these schools. I don't understand at all. All right, so the top, yeah, it's in the top twenty. So Harvard number one is forty billion. Yale two at thirty. Texas thirty. Stanford twenty seven. And then at the bottom of the top twenty is Cornell with seven million. That's insane. That is insane. Seven billion. That's sorry. that's that's ridiculous. Yeah, I don't know why those guys would be calling you, but I bet they do. They need your $50. Our software is the worst. Have you heard of HubSpot? See, most CRMs are a cobbled together mess, but HubSpot is easy to adopt and actually looks gorgeous. I think I love our new CRM. Our software is the best. HubSpot, grow better. Well, did I tell you about one of the really smart ideas was this thing called... uh, I forgot the name of the parent company. Ben, see if you can find it. It's uh, They made this thing called Tower View Venture. So one of the big streets at Duke campus is Tower View. And it's like the name of some magazine there or something like that. It's like a it's like a reference to something we remember from, from school. And it's basically Tower View Venture. We're raising money for, uh, for a venture fund to invest in alumni from Duke. It's like, oh, yeah, Duke has really smart people. Um, so, you know, we're going to invest in those companies. They've had these winners before, Cameo and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And they basically do this. For, they spin this up for every single top school. It's called, I think, Alumni Ventures. And they just spin up small funds for every single school. And um, and then they just run ads and call you to try to get you to donate, uh, try to get you to invest in their fund. And they're like, cool, we're just going to have like, like, like Tower View Ventures. They have, uh, I guess, started in 2019. There's, uh, you know, it's on fund five now for, for the Duke one. And like, I don't know how big these funds are, but like, even if they're like 10 million, $10 million funds or $20 million funds, you take 2% every year of management fees and 20% of carry across this times 50 other schools. It's like a pretty genius way to like pull on oh, the hard straight of, so it's a real business, the school. but there's, are, are they, does the, the school give them permission to use their name? Well, they don't use the name. They say we're Tower View Ventures and we're investing in Duke alumni. So they're not saying oh we're Duke's God. venture fund, but it may, they very much make it Dude, that's feel shady, like though. that. The, all the invest- colors match. It's like, here's all your school colors. Everything is like, uh, 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 you know, based off that. That's a scheme. That's a that's a hardcore scheme, right? You could do that for Belmont. <laughs> well, I mean, like, <laughs> like a, a $50,000 fund ain't going to go far. Do you right? think you're like, Belmont's most uh, successful alumni from your year? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I got beat. You know who it was? Who? F- Florida Georgia Line. What? You know that Florida Georgia Line, that band? No. <laughs> You've never heard of Florida Georgia Sounds Line? Like a territory that was annexed. <laughs> Dude, well, <laughs> the Florida, jo- Florida Georgia Line is like, if you go to your Spotify right now and like you look in the top 100 songs, I bet most years they have one or two songs they were in, in the your top year? 20. Yeah. You know that song Cruise? Like even Nelly made an appearance. I mean, you're just dude. Gonna, do you know who you know, Nelly is? Would you like to pants me right now in front of everybody? <laughs> no, I don't know who any of these people are. No, I know Nelly, but yeah, it's like Mike Posner was in my year, and uh, you know, no, Florida. Do you know Morgan Wallen? Do you know who that oh, is? Oh yeah, he's the shit. Love that guy. 
they're more famous than Morgan Wallen. Oh wow! So uh, not, not 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 to you, but they put they helped put Morgan Wallen on the map because Morgan Wallen appeared on one of their songs. Anyway, it, they're like a Morgan Wallen famous band. Cool. So they might be number one. I think I might be number two. But you know what? They never fucking call me. I got mad at them because here's let me explain why I got mad at them. My mom was going to come and watch me graduate, but I didn't finish school on time. And I asked like the teachers or whatever. I was like, "Can you guys just give me like a fake diploma and just let me come on stage and not tell her and I'll finish it at another point?" <laughs> And they're like, no, it's a tradition. You have to, we have to literally hand you your diploma there. I'm like, just give me an empty folder. I don't, I don't just, I literally just want to be there on stage. Just let me have that empty folder. And they wouldn't let me do it. And so forever, I'll, wow. uh, I hate Belmont because they wouldn't let me just walk on the stage and just let me shake that guy's hand and turn the fucking stupid beret thing to the side. <laughs> and they wouldn't do it. So I, I will always be mad at Belmont for that reason. Wow. What a, what an L for them. All right. I got, I got a couple more. So, um, let me see where I want to go. Okay, can I can I just rapid fire for you some ideas? Go. We don't even have to discuss them. Okay. Uh, exporting and you know my import export framework. My import framework and export framework is uh, if you're at a company and you wish some, you're like, dude, we would totally pay for this. That's a business idea you would want to import. You're better off going and starting that business because there's probably a hundred other businesses like you that would pay for that. Or export is we we built this for ourselves, and it's so useful you're better off leaving the company and then rebuilding that on the outside of the walls and selling it to other companies. So here's an is what Slack did. Um, yeah, exactly. Slack is a good example of this. Um, uh, so Paul Graham tweeted this out the other day that like YC has its own directory internally about investors where any startup founder can go look up any investor and he- read their reviews or kind of like, what's the scoop on this person? Have they done anything effed up? Are they really helpful? What's their, you know, what are the, what do we know about this person? And he's like, this is one of the best products that YC has. And I'm like, why is that a product only YC has? Um, this should be a product that anybody has. So I think somebody should export this out. And it's like Yelp for investors, where um, investors have a reputation on this uh, in this app. And it's all, you can only write about them if you had, you know, like, uh, let's say a, a verified interaction with them or something like that. Dude, that's great. I think I, I wish I could have that for a variety of vendors. The things that people ask for most at Hampton is like, hey, who's a good lawyer? Who's it a good accountant? Who's this? Right. Who's that? It's incredibly challenging to find reviews on vendors, including investors. It's super hard to start these types of businesses, but I think the uh, the startup community is so insulated that you could actually overcome the chicken and egg problem through brute force because there's not that many investors and you could find, you can quickly see who's worked with them just by looking at their portfolio and you could cold email them and be like, give me the scoop. And I think you could manually collect the data to get this going. Um, all right, here's another one. Teacher's pet is what I'm calling this. So this is my first AI idea for you here. So um, you're aware of Teacher's Pay Teachers, which is a marketplace. It's like Etsy. But instead of buying and selling handcrafted goods, you buy and sell lesson plans, quizzes, it's some, things that teachers need. Teachers pay teachers. Have you ever heard of this? We talked about it a while. We talked about it a while yeah. ago, right? It's a big business. So it, it was doing like $80 million a year in revenue. That's like their take, not the GMV. That's their their take. And it gets like 20 million visits a month during school years. Um, 300 teachers on this network have made a million dollars or more um, by selling lessons or selling quizzes or selling classroom materials to other teachers. So And like their new profile pictures like fuck them kids like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a creator <laughs> <laughs> so like these marketplaces are big and marketplaces for, mo- for the most part are pretty unassailable it's very hard to go compete with something that has a network effect but i think ai is one of these things that might be able to crack some network effects and i think ai could crack this one so i think you could train ai to crawl and learn from all of the materials on this network you can just go buy all the materials on this for probably like less than five hundred thousand dollars um, and then you could use that as your training data and you could train AI to basically become chat GPT for teachers. So you, so any teacher should be able to come to this and instead of going through and finding what's a good geography lesson plan and then going and buying it for $14, you just go ask this thing, Hey, I need a geography lesson plan for fourth grade. Um, make it fun and interesting. And it should just create one for you. So I think if you That's created cool. this, you could have a $20 a month subscription just for teachers to create lesson plans using AI. Um, or quizzes, or teaching materials, or whatever. <laughs> Teacher's pet. Teacher's That's pet. a good name too. <laughs> yeah, right, you want to? Do, you have one more. I'm big on providing a name with some with these ideas. Uh, I think that <laughs> yeah. that really turns Dude. it from like a uh, I don't know to like 
where's the application form for Thatcher Darby? Like, how do I get in? <laughs> what, what's this? You just have this funny phrase. It's for some reason funny to me. You call it an Ozempic on ramp and then an Ozempic off ramp. Yeah. So these aren't fully baked ideas, but I'll just spitball it with you. All right. So when I was thinking about this, you know, um, you want to surf on waves if you're starting a business. So what's a wave you could surf right now? Ozempic. I think Ozempic is like, if video is a mega trend, guess what? Fat loss is a mega trend. <laughs> Obesity is a mega trend too. Zuck. Have you tried it yet? No, no, I haven't tried it. But um, I know a lot of people that want to be on it or get off of it or are on I it. I got right? a like, guy. If it, I got a guy. I could refer him. No, no. It's expensive though. It's expensive. Yeah, I'm not interested, but I know a lot of people are. So I guess the question is, um, what could you build around this Ozempic mega trend? So um, my brain goes to on ramps and off ramps. How do you sell something to people that makes it easier to get it or help people get off of it? So for, for getting it, uh, if you go Google, just like, um, I don't know, like, how do I take Ozempic or like getting Ozempic near me? You get a bunch of like, kind of like uh, sponsored links for like telehealth services that are going to try to like, uh, you know, sign up for this. Here's the pills, basically. But what I think somebody should do is <laughs> I think somebody should go old school with it. I think somebody needs to create a Ozempic hotline. And what's the Ozempic hotline? So the Ozempic hotline is old school infomercial shit. So you're going to run ads on linear TV, on Fox News. You're going to be the My Pillow guy. You're just going to be everywhere that like <laughs> people who are like, you know, 40 to 60 are, are clicking and uh, or watching. And you're just going to show people's transformations and Ozempic and be like, call in now to, you know, get a free consultation. Are you eligible? What are the upsides? What are the downsides? How much does it cost? Where can you find it? So confusing. We are going to make it easy. We're going to give you a free consult. And you basically just become a lead gen provider for people who are trying to buy a Zempic. But I think you got to do like 1-800, like got abs or something like that, right? Like 1-800, <laughs> you know. But that goes against all your principles since you hate. Which principles? Uh, <laughs> as i like to say what values yeah, well we could find them somewhere deep in that closet uh <laughs> but I, I believe one or two of those principles be it besides which is coming out of left field the fact that you said that you don't want to kill animals to eat that that that's that's such a uh curveball coming from you but i think the <laughs> other one was i think you hate pharmaceuticals no uh no i don't hate pharmaceuticals i don't personally take i don't personally uh try to take a lot of stuff i try not to be dependent on anything um, you know, as a general rule, like caffeine, I don't drink coffee. I don't do, I don't do a lot of stuff like that. Um, you know, people take like, you know, I don't know. You, you love stuff. You're like, Oh, I'm, I need nicotine. Fucking I need this. I, need that. I love carbonated <laughs> water, Zen, Diet Coke. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I, I try not to be on any of that stuff, but, um, but people are, this is a business opportunity. I'm not doing this. I'm saying somebody could create a phone based way to, educate people and help onboard people or uh, the other side you could figure out an off ramp so so a lot of people want to stop this either it's too expensive or they're having side effects or or they just feel like they got the weight, weight loss they had they don't want to keep taking this forever how do you off ramp and uh, i don't know the answer to that but that's well a, i'll tell you the answer. place to go look what's the answer you just don't take it N nothing bad happens you just don't take it yeah but uh, don't, I, don't a lot I, of people I regain it. a bunch of weight right away or have like any sort of like i don't know Nothing, nothing that's this effective has no cost when you stop. I, I don't believe that. Yeah. So basically, the the when the the study that they did was they took two or three thousand people. They had them do it for six months, and then after six months, they had half the people quit taking it. And what they found was uh, at the end of the twelve month study, uh, the people who took it the whole time lost um, something like a third of their body weight. So like a three hundred pound person was two hundred pounds, and then the people who quit taking it they went from 200 pounds back up to like 230 or something like that. So they gained weight back, but they weren't nearly as fat as they were when they started. So they, but they did gain weight. But so yeah, an off ramp is fine. But I don't think you have like uh, withdrawals. Like that's not going to kill you. You're just going to like be like, oh, I'm hungry. Like I want to eat again. Yeah. And maybe uh, it's so just like peer groups or something. I don't know. Is, is there something you could provide to this large group of people that all have now like one, they're going through this one new experience, and I don't know. There's got to be auxiliary things around it. That's so that's a that's a place I would look for business ideas. Um, all right, I got a, I got another one for you. I heard something the other day that just really caught my attention. I think it's a cool idea, but it's being done in the wrong way. So I was listening to some podcast, um, and the guy who was talking, and it 
was like, yeah, I did mind sport and blah, blah, blah. And he started talking about mind sport. And I was like, mind sport, what a, what a great name. What is that? And he was a really smart guy and he was talking about game theory and blah, blah, blah. And I looked it up and mind sport is essentially the nerd Olympics. So mind sport is a place that you go if you're uber smart and um, you compete with people in those games. And so those games can range from chess to poker to settlers of Catan or go or whatever. Or like Rubik's cube. Yeah. Like, you know, if I was like, let's just put it this way, Sam, if I was to tell you, um, you know, that this, I could solve this cube in the next, you know, 90 seconds, you might not think I'm a genius, but you probably don't think I'm an idiot. Would that be fair? <laughs> are, are you going to solve that right now? Is that going to be part of the show? Because that would be great. I wish I could solve this. I have never even gotten <laughs> close. I don't know what the hell you're supposed to do with this thing. I treat it like a fidget spinner. <laughs> Just move it. And I'm like, ooh, that's cool. I got two blues and three yellows. That's awesome. Good for me. I pat myself on the back and I move on. <laughs> yeah. this, so there's the Mind Sports Olympiad. The, uh, you're in the, you're in the special mind sports Olympiad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm in the mind jog. <laughs> the mind's not moving that fast. Um, so, so basically you go to this thing and you compete in all these games or you compete in your game, but you can also compete in the pentamind championship, which is where you're going to play five of these games. And I'm like, Oh my God, Dude, like I'm the mega nerd to know what pentamind means the, you know, Coachella for nerds. And I was like, this is amazing. Um, and I just, I cannot tell you Sampar how, all in I am on the mind sport Olympiad. <laughs> I want to go. I want to watch it live. Like I watched the spelling bee live on ESPN. I want to watch the hard knocks documentary about like, you know, following five of these people behind the scenes and watching them stress out about this. I want to adopt one of the kids in this and just have them be like, you know, my 17 year old child. Um, and most of all, I want to hire all these kids. This is so <laughs> awesome. I, you're I, grooming them. I think you're, they have a, Sean's a groomer. <laughs> complete wrong business model. This is not a tournament with prize money and thanks to our sponsors, Wendy's. No, 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 no. You've got this all wrong. This is a recruiting event for the elite minds under 25 years old. And I was like, this is bait to bring together the smartest nerds. In five years, these kids are not going to be playing professional settlers of Catan. They're going to be starting companies or working inside companies. And guess where I want them to work? My companies. And so <laughs> I think that you should take this idea, create a version of this, but it needs to be a elite recruiting service slash job fair slash demo day for nerds. And you need to basically, when they attend, they need to basically somehow like sign over the rights for you to like send them job offers for the next five years or like, you know, get to invest in them or something like that. Because... I can't think of a m more valuable talent pool than the Mind Sport Olympics. And I, Dude, so I actually check this think out. you could do this for gamers in general. I love investing. One of my secrets of investing is I invest in former competitive gamers. Um, you know, people who were elite level at, you know, StarCraft or things like that. Those people just tend to do really, really well at whatever next game you throw in front in front of them. And once you throw the money game in front of them, guess what? They solve it. They figure it out. Um, and <laughs> so, so there's this. Yeah. Listen, there's this thing called the World Memory Championships. Have mm. you heard of this? No. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> and if, uh, yeah. And so they've been doing this since 1990, 1991. And there's a different game. So basically, we're going to get you, we're, we're just going to give you thousands of numbers and you have five minutes and you have to tell us like in order the numbers. And the record for that is 600 numbers and they only had five minutes to do it. The one hour number is the same thing, except you have one hour to do it. And then, and the guy who won that did 4,600 numbers in a row. He remembered that. And so they do these 10 different games. And in the same way that the UFC used to be like this, like a bunch of thugs fighting, like it was like barbarians. But now it's like the, it's like it's half WWE and WWF where it's like, you know, you slept with my wife. Now I'm going to beat you up. And it's other half like Martial your arts. movement. Is, <laughs> yeah. Your, your movement is magical. Look at his movement. It's so smooth. This is peak. Right physical performance we need uh we need dana white you know or Vince man to buy the world memory championships and we got to make <laughs> that great because i'm looking up the guy who won it alex mullen he's a he's a kid or no he's or i guess when he won it he was 28 and you know what he does for work now he's an x-ray person at a hospital <laughs> x-ray tech <laughs> uh, x-ray tech he's memorizing that, all dude. the x-rays 
what, what, why is this guy not this working for like brain is HIPAA compliant? What are we talking about? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Why is this guy not working for like you know BlackRock or Blackstone? Just like Rain Man in his way to like <laughs> yeah. you know corporate buyouts. That's what I'm saying, baby, undervalued assets. These are these are hidden gems. Uh, I'm not all in on memory because I think memory is like the pleb version of the the Olympiad. Like these other guys are like strategists, <laughs> but like memory is you know. Any rube can do memory, really. Um, you know, but, who, but if you're, dude, I can't even remember seven numbers, let alone six hundred. <laughs> I can remember two thirds of any phone number. That's all I got. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. So that's that's one idea. Um, okay, I got a couple other for you. Um, let me hit you with with one more, maybe. But we were out of time here. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go into overtime here and give you one more. Um, let's do one around churches. Okay, so. Something you know a lot about. Another area that I'm completely un- <laughs> uh, unversed in, but I know that other people do it. Um, Michael Girdley tweeted this out the other day. He said, uh, 3,500 churches are closing every year. I said, oh, well, what's, what's that about? What, what is that? It's a big number. And um, it's not exactly right. Actually, like what happens is 4,000 churches closed last year, but like another 3,000 open or 2,000 opened or something like that. It's like a net change of 1,500 churches, uh, but, but towards the negative. And there is a bunch of there are a bunch of stats about this. So, um, in the you know in in traditional churches, so the Christian Christian churches, attendance is down sixty five percent in the last twenty years, sixty five percent. And what happens is when the pews are empty, there's less donations, so then these churches end up having to close down. And uh, there's a trend, but so they they call them like, are you are you Christian? Are you Jewish? Are you Muslim? What what are you? And there's a there's a group called the nuns. They're just none. I don't know why they're calling them nuns instead of like sort of like atheists or whatever. Like wait, uh, nuns like N U N or N O N E. Yeah, well, that's all. That's that's also confusing. When you said nuns, I was like a bunch of ladies in like Agreed. hobbits. Honestly, big <laughs> slip up on their part. Yeah, but they could be the zeros. Th- they That'd did. Be they a did survey <laughs> them, and for Gen Z, I guess forty five percent would count as as none of the above, essentially for 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 religion. And this guy who um, studies churches or whatever said that. Of the three three 350,000 Christian congregations in the United States, one third are like vulnerable on the brink of collapse, basically. Like one third are like in the red zone and over the next 10 years will likely close. That's a huge number. And what are the opportunities? So I think that there's, I think you could approach this from multiple angles. So again, not a specific idea, but I do think you could look at this when you hear a stat like that. That's just an, that's just one that gets your attention. Like when Jeff Bezos heard the stat that like you know the internet is growing at twelve thousand percent a year, he's like, oh, I better go start Amazon. And basically, I think you could do that around around stats like this. So, how are these churches going to close down? Um, that in itself, the, the sort of the vulture business or the cleanup, the funeral business for churches, I think is kind of interesting. How are the how Dude, if, <laughs> forget saving them? It might. Help them, help them my, die with grace. In my neighborhood, uh, one block from my house in St. Louis, they turned a church into a condo. Right, yeah, exactly. So, so then, then I found there's this group called Niagara Consulting Group. And they're basically like, we help you restructure your church. What do they mean by that? It's basically, look, there's a lot of developers that are chomping at the bit to turn this into luxury condos. Like, we help you try to succeed. But if you don't, we'll get you an offer from one of these developers to turn this into luxury condos. And I was like, oh, interesting. But in a lot of places, they can't even do that because it's like, you know, like low, uh, low income areas that there's not really, they just sit there empty. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity to figure out how to deal with this. I think there's opportunity. If I'm a company like Calm, could I take $50 million and just buy physical locations across the country in one year through these searches and just have a weekly service for meditation and whatever, like um, even to have like like you know just local chapters basically franchisees that that are going to run them um so i think there's there's something to be done here whether it's trying to save them trying to help them fail gracefully figuring out what's a what's a pivot you could do for a lot of these i saw you just put a zillow link in here what you got so that's uh that's 10 doors down from my childhood home where my mom and dad still live um beautiful church it's a church that they turned into a seven uh, eight thousand square foot house and as a house, oh <laughs> it, it doesn't look that cool. But as like a meditation area, like it does right. look cool. As an Airbnb, fantastic, you know? <laughs> yeah, but look, it's $1.2 million and it's an 8,000 square foot. I mean, it's in St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm from, which isn't that nice. 
but they this company renovated this church into like right. a livable house. And then I met these other guys who turned one into a skate park. They turned an old church into a skate park. Um, and so it's like it is pretty fascinating because a lot of these buildings are kind of cool, but to have like the Church of Calm, that's kind of right. dope. And then if you're going to help them, I think this is going to be a side hustle. So like the church near us, they actually have like awesome events all the time. And I love to take our kids to it because it's like they just put on great events, wholesome, fun events for, for families and kids. But it's so hard to even know what the hell, like literally the only way I know is if I drive by, they have a little sign they put like in the front, like a for sale sign, but it'll be like, we're doing something this Saturday. It's going to have popcorn and bouncy house. I'm like, oh, I'm in. But I only catch it driving by. I'm like, these guys just don't know social media. And um, I had to call them to be like, hey, if I'm like an Indian dude who's not a member of the church, can I still come get the free popcorn? Like, you know, what's the deal around this? Is, are you like, are your doors open? Yeah, are they going to have like a color swatch <laughs> yeah, as you like, come in? Like, uh, like you're, you're not white enough. <laughs> exactly. Like, do you need to have recognized me? Uh, you know, like, oh, how does this work? <laughs> and so I couldn't even get a hold of them because I was like, they just have, they have like one old Facebook page with like, you know, an event from 2014. And I'm like, dude, churches need better social media. And I was like, I think you could just create like done, f done for you social media services for churches. If you wanted to get like a 10 to $20,000 a, a month side hustle, I think you could just do that just by going to every single church, just walk in and be like, Hey, your social media is not very good. I can make it look like this. And then you basically go on Shepherd, you hire somebody for $800 a month, and that person is going to manage 20 churches social medias for you because all the churches do, hey, it's the same schedule. It's every Sunday, um, same templates. You just need their color, their name, and you need to know like what's going on for them. Like, you know, just manage the, all of their Instagram and, um, you know, like social media accounts for them. So I think that's one that like, it's not that nobody's doing that, but there's plenty of churches that are not on board with that. And if you just wanted to go sign up a bunch of clients for 300 to $400 a month, you could do that. Did you, do you remember this? So have you heard of a Hillsong? I love like Hillsong. when I, uh, uh, it's like Hillsong church. Yeah. Um, when I was living in Tennessee, I've been an atheist forever, but I was just like, a lot of cute girls are going to this. I guess, I guess that's the price to be, that's the price I got to pay. <laughs> so I'll go to this thing. So I went to this thing to like meet some people. And, uh, that's how I kind of learned about it. But for in the later 2000s, there was this guy who somehow infiltrated Justin Bieber's camp and he like became Justin Bieber's Carl like Lentz. mentor, uh, Carl Lentz. And there's a new Netflix show about him. But basically, oh, nice. he's like, I have to see, I have to watch he's that. like, he's like a, a smoking hot guy. Like, you know, he looks basically like Justin Bieber in his 40s. Like, he looked great. I don't and describe most men as babes. But he's a babe. Well, he's a babe. I mean, like, <laughs> objectively, honest. like, you know, like, you, you're either seven foot tall or you're not. Like, he's seven feet tall. I, he's I, tall. I think I uh, messaged you once about him and you were like, dude, he's got the thing. Like, you know, like the, the diagonal lines that just point to your crotch. It's, like, it's yeah. like an ab line that you only have if you're super ripped. He's got those. What kind of pastor has yeah. those? <laughs> yeah. If you're a pastor and you have that V, it's bad news. And as as one could just look at his V and guess. He did some, uh, I don't know if he did any illegal things. I don't even, I, I didn't, frankly, I didn't watch the documentary. I don't know. I don't think it was rape. No, no, he, I think he it was just, just cheated on his wife. And yeah, they just had sex with just everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> got kicked out. as one, as one with all the power in the V might do. He, he's also super charismatic, super good looking, um, has like a, you know, a huge following from being on stage in front of 10,000 people every week or whatever, you know, it, he's a mega celebrity. He was. Yeah, he's a mega celebrity, but he made Hillsong cool. Like, I even went to one of those things uh, because this girl I was trying to date was like, come to this thing. Dude, I love the I music. Like, Their music is great. Uh, yeah, so I went I went to that thing just to be with this girl and it wasn't worth it. It didn't work out. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's how I learned about some of this religion stuff. Well, Dude, and where I'm from in St. Louis, all the Catholic churches are dying, man. The, 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 all the Catholic schools are, are, are going by the wayside. One, uh, one of the more working. useful things that I learned when I moved to Silicon Valley was a, a new way of looking at businesses that I hadn't really ever heard before outside of Silicon Valley, which is you, uh, most products are actually a bundle, not a product. Most things are a bundle. And once you can identify what's in the bundle, you could figure out how to unbundle that service and make something better. So for example, uh, Peter Thiel went on a spree where he was talking about how universities are a bubble, how the university system is, is overrated. He was going to launch the Teal Fellowship, which would pay you 
$200,000 to drop out of school and do something useful with your life. And that's where Figma came from. And that's where Oyo Rooms came from. That's where, you know, Vitalik, the creator of Ethereum, was it? He was a Teal Fellow. I think there's been $10 billion companies so far have come from it. Actually, a very impressive track record. And so one of the things he said was that they're like, how can you, you know, it was, it was sort of like taboo to say, like, you know, who says like anything against school? Right. Like everybody's mess- message is basically stay in school, kids. And he's saying, drop out of school, kids. And so they're I'll like, give how, you money. How, how dare you? <laughs> and he's like, well, the university is a bundle. He's like, it's partially um, education. So there are there is education. It's partially um, socialization. So, you know, you go there to learn how to like party and be with other kids and date and get drunk and all that stuff. It's partly um, babysitting. So it's basically my kid's not old enough. They're not mature enough to go to the real world yet. So like four years over here, let, let them simmer a little bit, then they'll be ready. He's like, it's partly insurance, which is like a societal insurance. Like, uh, look, I don't care what you do. Just get a degree, get a college degree. Cause that label, that stamp is going to be whatever. He's like, it's partly um, accreditation. So like, I don't care if you're the top student at Harvard, but if you got into Harvard, that's a signal that's strong enough for me as an employer to know that you're smart, right? Like if I, if I know you went to Harvard, it's a signaling thing. So he's like, you're actually buying all of these things when you buy into university, when you pay the crazy cost of university. And we have to ask ourselves, what part of that bundle is actually important? And what part of the bundle is failing? Is it actually a weak part of the bundle that could be unbundled? And so what he did was he switched the accreditation one. He's like, cool. What if I created something? I have a brand, Peter Thiel. I invest in Facebook. I created PayPal. What if I handpicked you know, 40 of the most promising college kids and paid them 200 grand to leave school. Now I've, instead of having just like some normal school badge, which is good, you get the teal hand picked badge, which is even more elite. So I'm going to like unbundle the university, give you a more elite badge. Um, and then I'm going to get rid of all the rest. I don't care about the socialization. I don't care about the rest. I'm going to be 10 X better at this badge. And, uh, you know, like YC is 10 X better at university in certain things than in others. And so that's brilliant. Yeah. So the question is, what is the church bundle? The church bundle is a combination of lecture for learning community, a place to gather and congregate every week. It's just a peaceful place. Like I like going to church. I used to go to church, not for like, like I kind of like the sermon, but I just love the feeling of being inside of a church. The aura of inside of a church was just very peaceful and grounding to me. Um, so it's a peaceful place. It's also therapy slash confession. Uh, so a place to get things off your chest. Um, and, and kind of with that is like being absolved of your sins, like just getting a clean slate. I was like, oh, okay, I feel less guilty. Um, you know, there's music. So some people go for the music vibe. Some people go for the food. Like Indian temples all have like free food. I don't know if churches have that or not, but like Indian temples, like a lot of people I know go because they, they actually like love the meal. Uh, but it's plus a good thing. Um, you show your loyalty to God. And so if you take this bundle of a bunch of things, uh, also dating, I, I, put, I put this on there. Like I know a bunch of people that like, they kind of want to meet someone who has maybe their values or is like, right. you know, Culture. like, yeah, it, it's like matches in some way. And they're like, oh, this is better than going and trying to approach someone in a bar where it's noisy and I'm getting rejected. Like, oh, what if I, I this is a new sort of like social scene where I can go approach somebody. All right. So I think one big, uh, so the small version of this idea is like social media for churches. The medium version of this is like restructure these churches into condos or figure out some lead gen where you, maybe you, you help them as they wind down to sell off assets or something. The big version of this idea is figure out how you're going to replace the value that churches gave people, but you can do it in a new way. And so like, for example, could you create a new brand in these same venues that's around, I don't know, like manifestation or some shit like that or meditation? Or um, yoga, like could you create a yoga franchise that only operates out of churches and some blend of like That's cool. religion and churches, right? Uh, sorry, religion and yoga, and like I think those are the big ideas, which is replace the function. Of one of the like be ten x better on one of those bundles, like ten x better on food or music or the sermon or um, absolving you of your sins, like you know, do do try to be better at ten x better of one of those, and then use the physical locations of churches. To like build that new franchise that's a very you, that was a good that was a good speech you did good on that one thank you we're gonna now, now we're gonna have a bunch of <laughs> you, we're gonna have a bunch of soul cycles uh on the altar yeah, uh exactly. which, could, which is a lot cooler than how it is now but that was a good you, that was a very compelling argument 
Thank you. I sort of ventured into drunk ideas territory there, but I no, feel like I no, grounded no, no. it, you know, a little bit. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> that was a good one. Uh, I'll let you. That's that's the winner or dribble. J- the dribble shit is the is the winner. All right. There we go. That's it. That's the idea episode. Uh, you know what to do. Do they just get all these ideas for free, Sam? Well, they don't have to pay money, Ooh. but it's not for free. But, so they don't have to pull out their wallet. But what do they have to do? Well, I think what they got to do is go to YouTube, go to your podcast app, search My First Million, and you got to click subscribe. You got to click that button for us because we're out here churning out million dollar ideas, billion dollar ideas, side hustle ideas for you. All on a Labor Day, no less. On a, I mean, there's only one right move. There's only one way to pay us back. And that's what it is. Go subscribe to the channel. That is called the Gentleman's Agreement. We're not going to go check. We're not going to we're not going to verify this. All right. It's honor code. This is a gentleman's agreement. We did it. We did our part. Now you do yours. That's all. All right. Thank you. That's the five. <laughs>